the people of sake actually brought me into sake. Back in 1988, this place was actually in Ginza on the main drag. At first it was kind of soy sauce, it was miso. To the point where it actually changed my life. New Year's Day 1989. Uh, not just sake as a beverage, but all the culture and history. And- Welcome to the Sake On Air podcast. My name is Justin Potts. I have with me... My name is Sébastien Lemoyne. And I'm Christopher Hughes. And this is the trio bringing you the world of sake uh, here in Tokyo at the Sake and Shochu Information Center. Just a short hop, skip, and a jump from Tokyo Station. Today, what we are planning to dig into is something that is personally kind of dear to my heart. The idea of searching for sake here in Japan. Sake tourism what there is uh, in the present day uh, for those discoveries and for those adventures or the lack thereof. We're going to discuss where you might want to go to discover sake. Ideally, this will be a podcast. This will be an episode that people can go back and reference down the road. Uh, A lot of places are starting to finally invest a little bit more time, energy, and resources into making not just the breweries, but sake in these rural areas a bit more approachable, a little bit more accessible to more people. So this is becoming a more and more fun and engaging and there's a lot out there but it's uh, still difficult to find information for a lot of these places and so what we're going to kind of do is hopefully just share some stories and some places and some information for you for our listeners that they can then go back and reference down the road so justin (laughs) are we tasting that sake now we've gone the nigori route this time we've got sake from Kikuhime in Ishikawa Prefecture. So for those of our listeners that don't know, this is a sake which has been... Thank you. It's been filtered, so it's still sake. The definition is still sake. However, when they filter the sake, they use a filter with kind of holes in it, basically. So some of the solids go through with the liquid, and that's why Mm -hmm. it's uh, this lovely opaque white color. Kampai. Kampai. That's good. So this is a staple. These guys have it down. Those, those fine ladies and gentlemen at Kikuhime, they got it down here. Um, so, what have you gentlemen been up to? Anything, anything excited? Yeah. Anything exciting you these days? Absolutely. Actually, um, and it's somewhat related to, uh, to our, our topic for the day. I mean, I was traveling around Tottori and, um, and, and Kyoto uh, a, a few weeks back, and I visited a brewery called Mukai Shizo. Mm. And I've seen photos. The brewery is located very near the sea in a beautiful cove. And they have this, I mean, the, the brewery has buildings on the two sides of the road. And so half of the buildings are actually facing the sea. And it's probably one of the best places to do a, a sake tasting or a, a sake meal. I mean, nothing comfortable, but just sitting on, a, on how do you call this, plastic, I mean, bottle racks yeah. and, and enjoying your sandwich there is great. But that, that was not my, my point. What I did buy there is some, um, some sake kasu, uh, so which are sake leaves, so the, the, the solids after the, the fermenting mash has been pressed. And this was sake kasu from sake brewed from kodai mai, which means ancient rice, basically a red rice. Mm. And I mean, I've been experiencing quite a bit with sake kasu and and koji at home to marinate all sorts of of food. But I was really, really happy, I should say, about the result of of, uh, using this uh, kodai mai uh, sake kasu to let some, I think they were pork cutlets, uh, mature for a couple of days in the fridge. This sounds amazing. When you use sake kasu as a marinade, you can mix it with a bit of miso. That's what I mm. usually do. You really enhance the flavors of the, of, of the food that, that you're marinating and you're increasing its water retention. So uh, you've got a very juicy meat uh, with enhanced flavors. Mm-hmm. And somewhere the, the, the Kodai Mai, so this red rice uh, sake kasu, adds some toasty cereal flavors mm-hmm. to, uh, to, the, to the pork. Actually, mm-hmm. it was pork this time. And to be done again. And of course, you can make a really good uh, version of miso soup using the, the kasu. 
right? If you if you don't have the paste one, you have to like you have to mash it up into a paste. But if if you and you can also buy the kasu in like a paste form as well. It depends how the the brewery presses their sake. If they press the sake using the old fashioned method, it's going to be like a paste. And if they use the the modern yabata method, uh, which is the name of the machine, then it's going to be like sheets. So you have to kind of mash it into a paste, which is a bit of work. But you just kind of sprinkle this stuff into your soup as you're making it, and it's it's lovely. It's really it's, nice. It's very lovely. It's very lovely. Notes of nice. sake. I said, yeah, I've seen, I've seen pictures of that. You're, when you said it's close to the ocean. You're kind of understating it almost, and that it's on the, you're yeah. basically sitting, you're hovering over the ocean essentially, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Very good. Nice, Chris. What's been keeping you busy? Um, so I popped over to the um, the Craft Sake Week uh, Kit Kat. Oh, did you make it over there? Yes. Yeah, it was a really nice event, actually. It's a nice little hostel in um, uh, Nihonbashi, yeah. which is... Uh, Sitan, right? Yes, Sa- Saitama. 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 I don't know how you pronounce, you pronounce that, that now. C-I-T-A-N. Yeah. Great little hostel to go and stay. And so downstairs, um, they have like a little bar area and an open kitchen. And uh, yeah, and some tables and chairs. And yeah, there were, it was just basically pick a table and order a set of sake. So they had these sets of sake. Uh, I think every day it was a different, they were uh, showcasing different breweries. Yeah, just, just to kind of get people up to speed. So you said mm. Craft Sake Week. Mm. Um, what is, so this right. is actually, so this is an event that's been going the last couple of years. The season has changed, but it's been in the spring, generally um, when April. Yes. This would be the end of April, where it's basically a 10 or 11 day sake festival hosted yes. in Nupungi. Yes. Um, where they bring 10, it's 10 different brewers yes. every single day, along with, incredible food and it's really approachable and it's just really really beautifully put together yeah Um, if you kind of imagine like if you're in the us or the uk if you imagine like taste of london or taste of new york or whatever the mm -hmm. taste of series of events Mm -hmm. that they do for uh food in those various countries it's a bit like that really it's a sake version of that this one so then this one with kit kat this was sort of together with the reason for sake and kit kat is they right so they've been doing collaborations for a while there was previously a Nihonshu flavor or sake flavor yeah. Kit Kat that came out, I believe, last year, two years ago. Well, two years ago. Kind of re- every two years ago, year, last year, they rotate the breweries. So right. every year they get a, a different brewery to contribute their sake to make this Kit Kat. And um, I don't know what brewery we're on this year. I didn't actually take a look. But this particular event was marketing the Kit Kat, which they have made with Umeshu. Umeshu. A brewery in Wakayama Prefecture teamed up with them. And Heiwa Shuzo, right? Yes, well, Heiwa Shuzo. Make, make kid. Make kid, yeah. Kid sake. And they make great sake. Yeah. But actually, when, they, when the current CEO took over the brewery, he actually started by innovating, by making a new type of umeshu. He wanted to kind of make the brewery famous through umeshu, and then sake came later yeah, on. Yeah, that really helped put him back on the map. Right? That's right. But I have to say, this, this Kit Kat, and it, was, it wasn't what I expected, but in a good way. It's really clever what they've done. It, they've just basically captured the kind of aromatic part of the umeshu and imparted it in the, in the chocolate. White chocolate. Oh, it's a great combination. Really, really nice. They just had these Kit Kats on the table for you to kind of try yourself. And then they had a selection of food. And then you could choose a, a sake set to pair with it. And the sake set I chose was set A. And that was Jiyondai, uh, Hakuko, and uh, Masuizumi. Um, all three, you know, very famous breweries, yeah. very good brands. Very nice. I'm sad. That's already over, isn't it? Yeah, sadly yeah. that's over. But there'll be more. Right. And, you know, when you come to Japan, be sure to check out the internet for craft sake events that might be happening. Because they're pretty... They're fairly regular. Very nice. How about, should we dig into a bit of news here? It's not Nihonshu related per se, but there is a soy sauce producer called Yamadoku Soy Sauce. Um, They're down on Shodo Island, Shodoshima, Mm -hmm. um, down in Kagawa Prefecture. And so for the last, gosh, how many years now? It's been, the project, I want to say it's probably been going for about four or five years, but they've been investing a lot of time and energy into helping redevelop the craftsmanship and the people who have the craftsmanship and the ability to make um, what are referred to as kiyoke. Mm-hmm. Um, these are these large wooden barrels that are used um, for the fermentation mash, for sake, for soy sauce, for um, miso, for things like that. The number of people who actually have the skill in order to craft these things, you can pretty much count on about one hand nowadays. So this is a treasure to, to not just the world of sake, but 
Japan's food culture in general that is seriously in danger of actually being lost. Mm. There is a real danger of that. And Yamaroku Soy Sauce has been really, really proactive, probably have the most proactive、um, project out there and really getting people involved and being able to learn in that process and train sort of the next generation of people to be able to make these things. And they recently, was, well, it was back in 2015. They had the expo in Milan. And for that, they brought over a kyoke for display, like a big one. They made it's kind of part of their project when they were getting their project going and to display and to kind of share this craftsmanship and do that. What came out of that was a collaboration with Baladin, which is the first quote unquote craft beer producer、mm-hmm. in Italy. And what they've done is they've done a collaboration using that kyoke and maturing that beer for about 18 months. Um, and that beer is just about to be released. So, finding avenues, new interesting avenues for using these kyoke and then using that with、uh, kind of a pioneering craft beer place like that overseas and making an original beer, I just saw that and it just kind of warmed my heart. Absolutely. And it'd be great to see more breweries reviving the kyoke as well, right? Because they, they switched over to stainless steel. And of course, that's why a lot of breweries don't use them. And they are quite hard work to manage. And you also need. You need to use them over a period of time because the idea is that they trap like particles of yeast and other microbes and things inside the gaps inside the, the wood and then they impart these kind of flavors later on when, you, when you're actually making the sake, which can be de- desirable and not desirable. It depends, you know, what type of sake you're trying to make. But it's nice to see this tradition. So you're starting、arrived. to see a bit more demand, yeah, which is、are. really, really nice. But even the places who do want those now are unable to get them because there's no one to make them well, or、yeah. they're too expensive.、Mm. Or, and it's not just a matter of making them or. Repairing the ones that are、mm. already out there. And that's a big problem, especially for a lot of like soy sauce producers、mm. and things like that, is that you've got places that have been using these things for 90, 100, 110, 20 years that they maybe don't have to make a new one, but to,、mm. pre- to repair these things,、um, is, that's, a, that's a big chore as well, too. Yeah, talking about tourism, actually,、yeah. uh, when you visit a brewery and you have a kiyoke or、yeah. a wooden koshiki,、yeah. which is、yeah. the equipment used to、uh, steam the rice, steamer,、yeah. you I mean, it creates a much stronger in, impression.、Mm, it and really it does. contributes to this craftsmanship image that,、uh, sa- mm, that Sake it、really、has. Does. And it's, it's not a one to one because they're used differently, obviously. But, you know, say you look at the world of wine and, you know, you've got wine barrels, things like that. Yes.、Um, as well, too, as far、yep. as keeping up production on those、mm. and the place using those.、Um, but nowhere near to the degree of Kyoki in Japan. And I, I mean, imagine visiting. I mean, there are, there are wineries now that it may not, you know, that may not necessarily to mature in, in、yeah. oak. They may use strictly、yeah. stainless and things like that. But when you go and you pay visits and you to these places, you want to see that,、mm. right? And I mean, imagine a world with no oak in the world、yeah. of wine. I mean, the world of no kyoke in Japan is a very real one. That's a real possibility. Yeah. That's something that's really, for me, is, is really scary. So I'm. Agreed. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a personal mission to kind of、yes. get the word out there. And so, yeah, to, to hear about this was very, very. And do you remember that brewery we visited?、Uh, we, went on, we helped out with the tour. It was, was it Masuichi, I think, in, in Nagano. And they had an amazing kyoke in their like, that restaurant that we went to. You remember that Masuichi? Ah,、uh, Masuichi.、Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. That well, was. They've, breathtaking. They've done, yeah. So、um, she has done、um, a lot of work actually、mm. in o、okay, k I I don't hear about her work so much recently, but about 10 years ago, was it Sarah Cummings? Yes. Who's, yes. She's,、um, she actually spent a lot of time really investing in sort of the revitalization of. of I, I had the pleasure、okay、of listening to her lovely presentation when I first、oh, came、nice. to Japan. Oh, very nice. 2014. Very, very, nice, very nice lady. Very nice. And yeah, very inspiring story. We、Absolutely. should interview her. We should. We should. We should. <laughs> Very nice. But yeah, I, I really like the way you brought us into the topic there, Sebastian. And I think <laughs> kyoke is one of those things. Like, one of the first things that comes to mind when I think of sake tourism is the architecture of these breweries. No brewery is, no two breweries are the same, right? They're all different in some way or other.、Uh, many breweries, they don't have the original buildings that they had, you know, all those years ago, but they have some parts, right? Some parts of the brewery are still the original brewery and then other parts are kind of tagged on or have been renovated or whatever, but it's just that, that aroma. You know, you, know, you get that aroma, right? When you walk into a really old brewery, it's、yeah. magical. So, and you can, a lot of them, as you mentioned, they are kind of been patchworked together、yes. over the years、yeah. as production has grown、yeah. and then dropped off and they've been sort of depending on the needs of different generations.、Yes. You can kind of time travel just strolling through the brewery 
of parts of the brewer were built 150, 200 years ago, and then 100 years ago, and then 50 years ago, and then in, we've just built this new tasting room over here. And so you're kind of traveling through several generations, just sort of strolling through the brewery. And it can be, it can be really interesting. It's a, it can be a jarring in some cases, mm -hmm. um, but in some cases, it's really, really fascinating. I mean, sometimes I was um, maybe lucky because I asked, but I, the, the Kuramoto, so the, the brewery owner, gave me access to, to the attic. Yeah. So the place where they store all the old uh, equipment and tools. Yeah. So this is really a traveling time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's such a magical experience. And uh, yeah, I can relate to that when I visited Kenkon Ichi in Miyagi and they have a, um, a similar type of brewery. And I remember him telling me this wall is this era and this wall is this era and the beams, you know, in the, in the roof, they're very the traditional Japanese beams where they don't use nails to, to stick them together. They kind of interlock them like... Um, like not Lego bricks by Jenga, basically like the game Jenga, right? Mm, yeah, but there's no there's no slots in Jenga. Yeah, right? there's no slots in Jenga. So That's it's very more true. Like, That's true. Uh, yeah, Tetris. Tetris. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the brief version of Tetris. But yeah, it's great. So architecture is a big thing. What? what? Yeah. Before before we dig in there, so first, is there sake tourism in Japan? Is that a uh, thing? Straight off. Yes. Does that exist? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. What does I mean, it look like? Is it different from so a lot of people? There's a lot of there's a lot more beer tourism nowadays. Um, wine tourism is something that has transformed economies of regions. What is what is sake tourism? How does it how is it similar or different from those? I mean, yes, clearly there is sake tourism, but sake tourism can be developed much more and actually will develop much more. And I guess we'll look at some of the reasons why it is uh, it has to be developed. Um, or what needs to be done to, to, to develop it. Uh, I just want to um, start with one, one point, is uh, sake tourism should be uh, international, like open to uh, every visitor. And sometimes in, in Japan, I feel that sake tourism for Japanese people or um, Japanese speaking people is a much larger world mm -hmm. than sake tourism for foreigners mm -hmm. uh, visiting Japan. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that speaks sort of to not just the sake tourism, but sort of the larger nature of just travel in Japan and the way that the tourism industry has sort of bit, built up um, historically. Japan, a lot of times it gets referred to being an island in a number of situations, and that's very much the case here, and that it was able to develop a large market with entertainment and activities and forms of travel built around a very specific market um, with different needs and interests from the international market. Now that the population is decreasing, um, interests are changing, you're starting to see a lot of rural areas of Japan that aren't necessarily as pretty as they used to be. They're beautiful, beautiful old areas, but a lot of the old lodging establishments, a lot of the old restaurants, all of these things, they haven't been kept up and they're not as beautiful as they clearly once were because the demands have changed, the market right. has changed, the people that are going out and traveling, visiting, and what they're looking for in these different experiences has changed a great deal. And it's very much different from the type of travel that was has been common for the last several generations that the entire industry had really built up around. And so and with sake industry or with sake breweries not being a real destination as part of that not only did you have an industry that was sort of developed without other interests and other visitors and things like that in mind, you also had a chunk of those local resources being the breweries that were not really integrated into even the pre-existing model. Yeah, because so kind it's of got the thing that we have to make people understand, especially if you want to go and visit a brewery and you get turned down, which can be a little bit deflating, you know, especially if you've got this passion for sake and you're, why are they turning me down? I just, I just want to see inside the brewery. I want to see, you know, you know, it's important to understand that maybe the biggest difference between wineries, especially the Chateau, is that a lot of them have these glorious buildings that they can show you around, but they're not actually using the buildings to make the wine, right? So they're free to do that. But what you have to understand about sake breweries is this: most of these buildings are being used to make the sake. And it's actually quite a dangerous environment in there, you know, when they're making the sake. And, and there, perhaps we'll cover this in more detail in another podcast, but you have to maintain a certain kind of um, microbially stable environment inside the brewery. And if you have lots of people coming in from outside, you're going to, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. And so traditionally, breweries have to kind of keep 
their breweries closed. There are other reasons why they might not be able to open up the breweries to English-speaking um, people, but a lot of the breweries are not even op open for, for Japanese-speaking uh, tourists either. But it's important to understand why that is. And I think the reason why a lot of breweries have started to open themselves up now is because the brewery is being seen as the key to reviving a lot of these, you know, um, kind of lagging, uh, what's the word, these kind of flagging, you know, towns where the population is decreasing and, you know, everyone's moving out to Tokyo into the big cities and these breweries are being seen as the, maybe the draw to bring people back into the, the towns and the buzzword is like tourism, of course, tourism, just in general. So, Sebastian, do you go and visit wineries in France? Un no tourism, yeah. uh, wine tourism is a major contribution to yeah. the tourism industry in France. Um, France is receiving 10 million visitors in, their, in, in wineries and, I would say, wine fields. And 50%, or cl I mean, close to 50% of these travelers, I think for, between 40 and 50% of these travelers are actually foreigners. Mm. So that's, that's why I was mentioning that point about uh, the difficult access that sometimes foreigners have here. Mm. Yeah, and that's insane for countries like uh, it wasn't too long ago that I was I spent uh, some time going to New Zealand um, annually taking um, farmers actually mm -hmm. <laughs> um, from Japan um, over um, looking at some sort of ag agriculture related um, uh, projects and one thing we would look at is uh, wine tourism and you've got it's a bit of a different situation from Japan obviously in that they're much more reliant on on exports. Um, being such a small population-wise compared to Japan, so it's a, they're in a bit of a different situation. But you've got areas where you know you'll go and visit and say, "Yeah, there was nothing here 20 years ago. Mm. There was maybe a brew, uh, a winery or two 20 years ago." And you've got just a beautiful, beautiful network of uh, collaboration of not just the wineries, but local restaurants, local dining activities, art galleries, all these things. You don't, it's no struggle whatsoever to go and hunt out down these experience. You just basically have to Google winery visit or wine tour in the area that you're, that you're after. And you've got plenty of options ready available and they're all really generally really high quality experiences right. it's really about the art de vivre actually yeah. beyond yeah. the the alcoholic beverage itself no? absolutely absolutely and that's something that i think is going to be really key for getting sake breweries back being sort of central to those regions again um a lot of times they really were traditionally they of were course. very central yes. to these communities and to these areas and so once again sort of these they're really iconic um we were talking about the architecture they're very central presence wise another thing would maybe be like temples or shrines or things mm. like that but aside from that what do you have in all of these areas that really signify japan especially maybe to a lot of non-japanese visitors is a brewery can be yeah. a really really i think all they need is the infrastructure a lot of these towns like to, to run this kind of sake tourism you know i think maybe some of them lack accommodation for example or you know no problem with the other things to see they've they've got you know, uh, plenty of things that you can see and do, but perhaps on the infrastructure side, they, they are a little bit lacking, especially for catering for, you know, in, uh, tourists from overseas. Justin, have you seen anything happening that, that, you know, suggests that maybe we're not that far off of having our own little Napa Valley experience in, in Japan? I, mean, I think it's only a matter of time. Yeah. So everybody's paying, especially in this sense, just sake in general, they tend to pay attention to what the wine industry is doing mm -hmm. um, in other countries as a kind of, as a point of reference for what's maybe possible. And sake tourism, sake, what they say, sake guru tourism, essentially sake brewery tourism has been kind of a big buzzword uh, through the bit, lots of push from the Japanese government and mm. to really uh, help build up um, help support these types of projects. Um, so not just individual breweries, but areas that are putting together the infrastructure to be able to offer these different types of experiences, as well as helping fund or support breweries that are willing to invest in the infrastructure to be able to bring on tourists and things like that. Because it's a, it's sort of a new concept. It's important to foster exchanges between the breweries to define best practices or what can be best, best practices mm -hmm. um, and these best practices are not the same for every client obviously Absolutely. because you've got uh, four different populations that uh, want to visit a winery or, or a brewery I mean you have the tourist who has no particular interest in the product itself but happens to be here looking for a fun experience something new to discover a bit of education 
uh, some fun and sometimes there are groups. You have the amateur who is coming to that particular place because he wants to learn about it, about its products, about its story, and is much more individualistic in, its, in his attitude. He wants sort of a personalized experience. You've got the opinion leader, uh, the, 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 the scout, like the journalist critic that is coming to uh, learn about the, the place and will uh, publish about it later on. And you have, you have a very high-end clientele as well looking for exclusive experiences, exclusive dining experiences, exclusive lodging experiences, an exclusive visit of the place and an exclusive tasting. So practices, I mean, best practices and the way to handle these clients will be different, but fostering exchanges about these practices will, uh, will, will help, I think, uh, the development of sake tourism. Yes. Getting feedback from the people who visit as well, right? That's also important, getting feedback from the people who come and visit these breweries. They are predisposed to anticipating a certain type of experience. And they're open to it being different to a degree, of course, because they're in Japan, they want something uniquely Japanese, but at the same time, people have certain expectations. So how do you fulfill those? Especially when you're looking at possibly, you know, more higher end clientele or people that are used to having maybe certain services associated with wine and travel and lodging and dining and things like that. Um, so there's a great deal of uh, ed education that has that's taking place at the moment. And, and bouncing back on uh, what you just said and what Chris was saying earlier, uh, sake tourism uh, could benefit from really bringing together under a single label uh, in a particular town, in a particular region, all those who contribute to the experience. So not only not the brewery only, yeah. but the transportation company, yes. the, the firm that is going to propose a, a nature mm. um, trail, for example. I mean, of course, I'm thinking I'm, I have my uh, French roots and I'm thinking mm. of everything you can do in, in, uh, in, wi in vine fields mm. in, mm. in France, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, the restaurants, the hotels, and unif I mean, not unified, but bring all these people under uh, a single banner single label right we, we and, and very that. people very many people and organizations look at the breweries to take responsibility and do this but i don't think that's really fair because you know the breweries have to brew sake they're pretty busy already as it is it kind of does need someone else to take the initiative mm -hmm. and i hear a lot of breweries crying out they'd love tourism to happen you know in their local area but they just they can't take on that responsibility of trying to organize it themselves you know exactly. they're opening themselves up to tourists but obviously that isn't enough they know that's not enough but that's as much as they can really do maybe we should dig into yeah. like where people should go like yeah. should we give some suggestions of where people might want to visit and like what would what should they expect from a typical yeah. brewery visit well i guess you, you can kind of break it down so you've got breweries that you can visit that will give you a very educational experience i guess you can go and learn not just about where you're at but about sake what is sake where is the you can get a tour you can get experiences so for people who are going to a, a sake brewery for an that educational experience they want to learn about sake um, versus just places that offer just really nice experiences they might have a nice tasting room nice dining it may not be a super educational experience but it makes for a really lovely afternoon and you can that it's on the brewery level but then you also have kind of the regional level where you can go and spend a day or two or three and visit maybe a couple of breweries but also be able to easily integrate a lot of other types of experiences and things like that some of so, these breweries have really surprising facilities. You know, like uh, there's one in um, in Kanagawa Prefecture. It uh, makes the brand Tensei, Kumazawa, Shuzo. And I lost track of the, all the things you could do in this one brewery. You know, it's not a massive brewery by, by any means, but, you know, it, you can easily fill half a day, you know, um, visiting that brewery. And I think that will come as a surprise to a lot of people who just expect this kind of factory, maybe, making sake. Um, there's so much more to discover. And that's typically a place where you don't get too much of the education and True. you don't see too much inside. That's True. really about the experience mm. um, in, uh, in your 
uh, yeah. justification. Just right. in, uh, yeah. But I agree, it's a great destination. But you don't need to, right? You don't need to see the whole process maybe in your first visits. Maybe, you know, as you get to know more brewers and you get to, you find a sake that you fall in love with and maybe you can find your way into the brewery into one of their little, you know, um, making experiences, production experiences or something. It's not, like, what I want to say is it's not normal to be able to go into a brewery and see the sake being made. You know, as I explained earlier, it, these places are, quite dangerous environments it's a lot of responsibility on the brewer's part to actually bring people in and into that dangerous environment look after them and and show them the process in in a way which is understandable and meaningful absolutely Um, but do you know any breweries just in where you can go and you can have this educational experience i mean i I know at least um two which are close to each other and i'm Mm -hmm. talking about uh, the nada uh, oh. sake producing mm. area so we are near Kobe mm-hmm. Nada was I mean still is the biggest sake production region mm-hmm. in the world uh, by far and that's where you have a high concentration of uh, large and smaller brewers yes and some of these houses with a long history there uh, Hakutsuru or uh, uh, Hakushka they have transformed their historical kura so their historical breweries into museums yes uh, uh, of uh, sake uh, of sake making another example is the okura museum of gekkeikan yes i was going to add um, in, in yeah. kyoto in fushimi yeah. i mean these are great places mm. to um, to learn about sake history and and the craft that goes into it so yeah well, along those lines getting it sort of that larger scale i was actually just down in saijo recently down in hiroshima and like uh kamotsuru is just it's like kamotsuru town down there um and you can just wander for days and there's a whole lot to really pick through and really kind of take in the environment there and it's kind of an interesting environment as well whereas five minutes from the station you have this concentration of eight nine breweries and they're all really unified in sort of their visual style as well and sort of construction they have this this, these sheer white walls just lining all all the streets and you can just kind of waltz in and out of and i said this kind of goes beyond education but and goes out a little bit to more to the experience but it's a place where you can kind of get lost almost in this mm. this little maze of little white walls. It's and, like the Harry Potter, the Harry Potter these. place, right? Absolutely. You turn Absolutely. the corner, you're in the what's called Diagon Alley. Or something, exactly, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. It's mm. the it is the Diagon Alley of of the sake world, without and, a doubt, and, because you yeah. can wander in. Cause you're on the, this white wall maze, and but then you can duck into all these little side streets, and all of a sudden you're in a little shop mm. that sells this and that and the other thing, and it's just it's a very easy to go and get lost for a yeah. half a day there and it's really really accessible there are a surprising um, like large amount of these kind of sake streets aren't there sake brewery streets absolutely yeah i mean we were talking about the infrastructure clearly access and communication into cities into and inside cities is easier than what i would call the countryside so uh, indeed some of the destinations that come to my mind easily uh, if you want to visit a number of breweries are these uh, cities with a sake brewing tradition. So yeah. you mentioned Saijo in Hiroshima, but uh, Sua in Nagano yeah. is another place yeah, where you have all these breweries on the same street, along the same street, and they actually do a great event uh, twice a year, the Miyaruki, where, mm-hmm. so which, which means um, drinking while walking, yeah. where they team up together and you, and you buy a ticket that gives you a a glass basically and you can uh, take sake from uh, each of the breweries that's that's a lot of fun and another one is, is takayama i mean takayama yeah. uh, more than uh, sua today is uh, often on the itineraries of uh, foreigners visiting japan mm-hmm. takayama is one of these areas in gifu right in it's gifu, national yeah. heritage yes, isn't it yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. where you have national a number heritage. of breweries that are accessible i mean here again you don't see too much of the production process that's but, true but they yeah. are beautiful buildings mm. and if you pay attention within these testing rooms or uh, or around them there are lots of uh, objects that talk about sake brewing and culture a lot of them have nice little shops don't they yes. uh, you know that you can just kind of walk around and um that's that's quite funazawa it's funazawa shizo isn't it funazaka shizo sorry yeah, that yeah. has the lovely really really big shop i mean you could lose yourself in that shop and they have this amazing courtyard as well and a lovely yeah. little restaurant that's, Great what, experience. that's what i mean like you just go to these breweries and you don't expect you know anything more than maybe just like a you know a quick sake tour or anything but a lot of them i think you can have a better time there if the sake tour isn't the main feature if you've got other kind of things you can do as well and um i just want to 
point out that you don't have to go as far as Hida Takayama, uh, Gifu. You know, there are great breweries if you come to Tokyo, which, let's face it, is the gateway into Japan, right? So you arrive here. Maybe, you know, you've only got a day or two. You don't know what you're going to do. Visit a brewery in Tokyo. Mm. Tokyo has breweries. Not yeah. many, but we've got some left. And, and you have to go a little bit outside, you know, the center. But an hour away by train to Fusa is the marvelous uh, Ishikawa Shuzo. And I would just describe their brewery as a sake theme park. With beer as well, if you like beer. Yeah. They've got their own Sobo restaurant. They've got a, another restaurant. Italian. I think they open an Italian restaurant. They will do a tour. Even without an appointment, you know, there's uh, someone who can, there are a lot of staff who can speak English. Mm-hmm. It's a quick, no frills tour, but if it's your first tour, so for a lot first of people, tour, and, and that's really important is to be able magical. to have it's like, where can I, I can, where can yeah. I hop on a train, be somewhere in 30 minutes to an hour, yeah. go enjoy myself, learn a little something, right? Taste, have something good, spend two or three hours, and yeah beyond my next thing that's a that's really really valuable for and and if you feel that going all that way just for one brewery is is a bit you know it's a bit of a trek the good news is that there's another two breweries you can visit in the vicinity there's sawanoi um and they've been doing you know sake experience or tours or you know for for a long time now but again it's not just a brewery you've got all this got this little restaurant town and it's a hiking on a hiking trail so there's oh, nice. all these natural spots you can visit there's a comb museum a japanese traditional comb museum which i popped into it's quite interesting it's great to go in the summer and in the spring with the cherry blossoms and and then there's another one which is a much smaller experience to be fair but there's tama uh tamamura shuzo um, which is very close to Sawanoi. The brewery visit isn't much, but the gardens are amazing. And they have this old kiaki tree. You know, the, 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 I think it's like 600 years old or something, this tree. And it's supposed to, people go there because they think it's a spiritual uh, energy spot. And I touched oh, the tree, okay. I didn't feel anything. But, you know, <laughs> if you believe in that type of thing. And near Ishikawa Shizu, if you really want to make two breweries in the same day, you yes. have Tamura as well. Yeah, Tamura, sorry. Yeah, Tamura you have, you have to, uh, to, to book the That's right. experience yes. online. But, it's, I mean, Ishikawa and Tamura share this uh, culture. I mean, they, oh, they were owned by former village heads who had the responsibility in the, under the, uh, the shogun to, I mean, they were taking, taking care of uh, certain tasks and duties. I think, was it, is it, was it Ishikawa or Tamura? One of the two was responsible for supplying ayu, which is river fish for the sweet fish, co- yeah. sweet fish for the, for the Korean embassies or something mm-hmm. like that. So that was the main uh, role in the, in the, the shogunate, but they were brewing sake as well. And so they were wealthy families and Ishikawa Shizu, the buildings are part of, uh, of uh, Tokyo's heritage or mm. maybe Tokyo. Japan's heritage. Oh, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, Absolutely know. gorgeous. So how did you get that information? You had a long talk with the, uh, <laughs> been there a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and Sebastian's good at prying out yes. information and, and yeah. digging deep. And fi- finally for Tokyo, there's one, Right in the 23 wards of Tokyo, there used to be two, that's just one, but there's one in ne- right next door to Tokyo Tower, I mean, in the vicinity of Tokyo Tower. I don't know if they do tours, but they're very open. You know, if you want to go and visit the brewery, I'm sure that's not a problem. And uh, so there you go. You don't have to go that far. Yeah, you were, you were talking about um, because a Tensei as well, that sort of yes. brought to mind. And then what I think a lot of people forget is uh, Hakkai-san up in Niigata mm. is actually... Mm. really 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 accessible mm. and it's beautiful up there um they don't have a big tour set up um what they do is they have one room where they um where they have their snow cave for, yes for storage, i've seen photos of right? that yeah um where they have a number of tanks in there and they, mm. they keep it cold all year round because they've got just mounds and mounds and mounds and mounds mm. of snow stuffed in there and so you can just kind of stroll through that and then you go out into a tasting room and it kind of gets forgotten because it's a little bit it's a little bit of a trip from the closest station you probably mm-hmm. have to it's a little bit of an access issue but you can take a bullet train get up there hop a taxi it's about a 20 minute taxi ride but you can easily go and spend the whole day because it is just a in, field in, in the of, station alone mm-hmm. you could you have this sake vending machine oh so that's so that's far Shop, away right but that's really oh, far okay away. So okay that's, that's way up in the city of niigata so the, oh, okay. they're, they're a little more they're more south oh, okay. south niigata but they have like, Soba place, pizza place, bakery, sweets, another shop. They've got, again, Kaisan makes beer. Now they make a lot of amazake. Mm. Um, they have big, they've all this, you can just spend a half day up there, and it's mm. absolutely beautiful. You're in the foothills of the mountains of Hakkaisan. You're staring up at Hakkaisan, and you're surrounded by greenery. 
And yeah. it's just, it's really, really beautiful. And, and it takes been, no effort and it takes no and there's, there's one sake close knowledge to, to be able to go out. There's really. one close to Niigata Station as well. You've got Asahi Shuzo as well, make the Kubota brand, and they've got their own restaurant. So they're not by Niigata Station. So they're. No, in, they're, well, they're, 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 a train, uh, they're a train right away, to be fair. So it's uh, like uh, one of the uh, first and other two stations away, I think, isn't it? So they're, they're in Nagaoka. Nagaoka. But it's, it's yeah. certainly accessible from. It's absolutely. From, for everybody from, who's got a yeah. rail pass. Yes, they don't need the rail pass. They don't have to think twice. You need the rail pass. But that's another great place to go and Co Sebastian you yeah know. but I was saying uh, coming back to Hakai San they've been contributing a lot to the world of sake education yeah absolutely. Um, made really interesting yeah, kind absolutely. of classic but interesting um, movies um, mm. footage I should say yeah. about about sake brewing yeah. so um, yeah you get the education as well there yeah, yeah. absolutely absolutely so, and they have a, they've set up shops not um, around, they've sort of have a whole another side business on sort of like fermented, fermented mm. food products and local products and stuff like that. They're really developed around Tokyo. So there are access to their products, not just their products, but a lot of food in and around Tokyo as well too. Yes. Um, which is a really, really, they've, they, they tend to kind of fly, everybody knows the name, but they kind of fly under the radar a little bit for some of these other activities that they're actually really, really proactive on or building a really beautiful model around. And it's a really, it's, it's easy to, easy to recommend. One, um, I mean, that, that brings one idea in my, to my mind. It's not really tourism, but about sake discovery when you travel through Japan. I mean, there's a, a shop I often go to in, in Ginza. It's, a, it's actually Fukumitsuya. Fukumitsuya yeah. ah, is yes. a Kanazawa mm. brewer, mm. a brewing company located in Kanazawa. And they made the decision to open their own retail shops. Yeah. And, and you have a few across scattered Tokyo. About. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're, introdu they're not only selling sake, they but they're ice selling cream. ice cream, right? Ice cream, oh, yeah. sake vessels, yeah. sake kasu, yeah. koji. I mean, all, really the, all the, I mean, not all, but a, a very large number of elements right. uh, of sake culture. They do. They do. I Which said, brewers have we not mentioned? Um, mm. I said, well, yeah, well, we can't. No, we can't mention. We can't them all. mention everyone. We should, yeah, we should probably preface this with a. We don't know. Yeah, everything everywhere. We have not been to everywhere. I've heard beautiful stories about so many places that are up to really, really fantastic work. Yeah, I have a long, long list of to go places. This is not by any means a definitive list. No, <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. Um, we're just kind of trying to offer a few uh, ideas uh, mm. for a few possible suggestions or mm. places that might be worth uh, checking out because this is something that's really important and. Can really mm. add to an experience an, it an itinerary in japan uh, for people who are visiting or people or for people who are already here who mm. have never who are looking for things to do or ways to get out of the countryside as well too um, i would hope that there's yeah maybe some people listening who live in japan maybe they've been here for a long time and they feel like they've seen and yeah. done a lot but there's actually a lot of places there's that still are really a lot of places you can pop out and go, and go and explore why um, don't we end with favorites favorite absolute favorite sake visits sake brewery visits that's let's see that's like selecting your children again having to choose <laughs> and I said, as, as somebody who has a couple i know I yeah like, i have a, i have trouble with that um i don't know there's a couple that just kind of come to mind is izumibashi just down in yes in kanagawa just yeah. south of tokyo so that's just that's within an hour they're really focused on rice production as well so mm -hmm. that's really right there so you can kind of see can have a tour the of the rice fields yeah um, they start things out there, so you get sort of that educational experience. While mm -hmm. at the same time, they got a really lovely restaurant on site. They just there. opened up, yeah. Yeah, so you can go through and get that whole experience, kind of from the rice field through the brew brewing process. And they tend to focus on kimoto and those traditional t styles of production as well. So you can kind of and near the train it. station, and it's, it's yeah, a walk away. It's a walk away. You yeah, can walk from the train distance, station. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's a nice one. You know my honke? Yeah, I actually I'm. I have to say, I actually have not been out oh, there I've yet. Oh, I've been, I've been twice. I've, I've heard really yeah. good things. I've heard I that went, they've put a, together a pretty good educational program where they got yep. the tour and they actually teach you and sit you down yep. and do tastings and stuff. Really good. Um, and I've heard, yeah, I've heard really good things. Great shop, and they have a little restaurant. It's only a hop and skip, you know, away yeah. from the center of Tokyo, but it's yep. a completely different part of Japan. Absolutely, I would say a couple of regions that I would really, really recommend. The Noto Peninsula. Oh, yes. I haven't me. been yet, but I just, I so want to go. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, first time I went, I was kind of shocked that this Japan still exists. Mm -hmm. There's just this beautiful cohesiveness out there in the countryside, not just the breweries, but just uh, the nature of the homes, sort of the construction, the architecture. It's just, it's absolutely beautiful. And you've got different areas like the Wajima area. You're just within walking distance. You've got, I believe, five producers that are all right there. Um, markets on um, the town is lovely. 
And if you extend to sort of the larger region in, on the peninsula, um, you've got places like Sogeng. Um, Sogeng is really great. So I'm, I'm not sure how, how accessible their tours are right yet. Mm. I'm not sure. They've got some kind of interesting stuff set up there where they've got kind of the, the train line runs right behind their brewery. It's a train line that is no longer functioning. Um, they put a little trolley kind of on there, and you can go and you can kind of ride that into the, the tunnel. And they actually use that for stock um, storage for sake now. And so you can go and buy your sake there, and then you can leave it there too. Ah, that reminds um, me of Azuma Rikushi in Tochigi. Okay. Um, they have this bat cave where they okay. store all their sake, and you can go and visit. And, oh, and nice. Yeah, but the difference is that at uh, Sogen, you can uh, you buy sake from mm. them, and they store it for you. Is that the case for Azuma Rikushi? Yes, it's the same. Okay, right. It's okay. quite expensive, though, because you, you're, most people are doing it as like a kind of an inheritance gift for their, for their mm. son or daughter when they mm. become, become of age. Mm. I don't see many you know, um, overseas uh, visitors or okay. people going in and buying. But maybe, is that what you can do at Sogen, then? It's quite... Yeah, I'm client affordable. number 100. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've got they, a couple of have your stack. I've got they a couple of stashes there. Yeah. <laughs> and nice. I give a shout out to uh, Wakazakari in Tochigi, another one in Tochigi, mm. Oyama City, a very, very, very accessible. Mm. And it's so big. I mean, the shop is massive. Um, and I think they do tours as well. Actually, it's quite, they often do like a festival once a year around the new year, just after the new year, which is uh, nice to go and visit. Very close to Tokyo. Very nice, yeah. Yep. Um, nor- Northern Guma. Yeah, yeah. Up that way, it's beautiful up that way. You've got four producers. What, you've got, got Nagai, Nagai Shuzo, Shuzo, yeah. Um, you've got Homari Shuzo. Shuzo. Yeah. Yeah. You've got Tsuchida Shuzo. Yeah, Tsuchida Shuzo, yeah. And then, was it the other one? Was Nagai Honke. Yeah, Nagai Honke. Nagai. So we actually did a tour. Uh, the Saki 2020 uh, actually went on a tour. Oh, nice. but we took a bus up there. I able to make that one. Yeah, and it was amazing. I mean, they have an amazing garden and like, you know, like temple uh, called Kichijoji, which mm-hmm. is, um, I've been there twice now, once in the autumn leave uh, Koyo season and then on this tour. And it was a bit colder and whiter. But yeah, that's an amazing nice. place to go and drink tea and look at the lovely scenery. So, yeah, just that whole area. The really nice thing is they've got beer breweries, got wineries, and mm. then it's a big... Uh, region for uh, like adventure tourism, outdoor tourism. So uh, if you go, there's rafting, canyoning, hiking, climbing, all these other things. See, and it's just beautiful up there. It's just se- seasonally really, really distinct. Um, and they've got it set up to where it's pretty accessible with buses and things like that. And a lot of the, the producers there are pretty collaborative. Um, so they know what one another are doing, the experiences that one another are offering. So you can go in there and, and get really distinct um, experiences at those different places, so it was really, okay. really, really um, lovely. I think the question is, uh, yeah. is a bit tough for me because sake tourism is <laughs> yeah. uh, very important to my activity. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I visited um, a number of them with clients. Um, in terms of, of public visits, there is one I want to mention. Mm. I was talking about Nada uh, earlier, about yeah. Kobe. Uh, this is a pretty intimidating environment. This is the area where... Uh, these breweries are located is not really nice. You're yeah. kind of squeezed between the highway mm. and the Nippon Steel Mill. Yeah. So uh, it's not a lot of fun. So you have to find mm. some oasis. Yeah. And I mean, some of them are these uh, museums. I was talking about the yeah. Kutsuru uh, Historical Museum, but uh, a great brewery that I. That I, I mean, one of my best experiences type of public visit was actually Yasufku. the The way you are well, you, the way you are welcomed, and the tasting experience, and the brewery visit itself is uh, really worth a small detour if you're in this area. Nice. I think That's we've nice. sold sake tourism, right? We this should have sold sake tourism. So. If you were only sold on the idea. There's one thing I, I like to uh, talk about is um, sometime the moment the moment of slight uneasiness mm. at mm. the end of the tour <laughs> when uh, some you've tasted a few sake and you're about to leave and what when you're visiting from abroad it's true that um, um, to, to, to buy sake especially large quantities of sake with you or just to take with you for, for, for travel that's a debate that's a conversation we've had uh, we've mm. had uh, many times uh, justine mm. but uh, in terms of best best practice yeah. i i definitely encourage the brewers to um, to charge some um, some minimal fee for the uh, for the, the tour. for the tour and for the tasting and uh, hopefully 
that will make the... Uh, well, even if they don't do that, let's just, when you visit a brewery, you know, it probably doesn't cost you anything to, to see the brewery. So just buy a bottle of something. Mm. Just, you know, <laughs> get an apron or something, you know, some soap or cake or whatever. Just it's made out of cassie. Get some, buy something. Right. I said, if you're if you're adventurous, for better or worse, right now you can go on have some pretty incredible experiences. Yep. If you're if you're if you're patient, um, you can have some pretty ex- incredible experiences for next to nothing, which yep. is probably going to change. And honestly, ideally, probably should change for all the reasons that Sebastian was mentioning, is because yep. you get uh, a huge, huge time and energy investment for a really unique experience that that can still has room to be developed as well too. And so, investing in that experience is what's really going to help them to then further develop that and be able to build something even more interesting and exciting and something that can then feed back into the region and the brewers and the farmers and all those lovely people that help make it all possible. So with that, I'm not going to lie, I have a train to catch. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to does, you know. wrap it up. Does um, Before we check out here, does anybody have any last words of wisdom? Any last, anything to share that they have to get in there before they... Go visit a sake brewery if you're coming to Japan. You know, uh, it might already not might not already be on your itinerary, but please add a sake brewery. Go to a sake brewery because you'll get much more than sake. Actually, yes, no, yes. absolutely. Well said. I'm going to leave it at that because that's exactly that's exactly what we're going for. A lot of the places we've again we couldn't. There's no way we could have covered everywhere today. Um, for those who did not get mentioned, we will integrate you again when we do round two somewhere down the road. Um, we love you all. Uh, until then, thank you very much to all of our listeners and all of those sake curious or sake travelers and everybody out there looking for a lovely sake experience. Where can we find both of you guys? Where, If we're looking for more information from your guys' activities and what's going on? I have a website. It's www.sakenotabibito.com. And I have a blog, sebastienlemoine.wordpress.com, which links to my company's website as well. And you can find me at uh, www.potsk.com. And this uh, little podcast is made possible with the help of the Sake 2020 project. If you Google Sake 2020, I'm sure it will come up. You can find information there. And we do this with the support of the, the Sake and Shochu Makers Association. Um, if you're in the Tokyo area and you're looking for a brewery to visit, a good place to start is the Sake and Shochu Information Center um, in Tokyo that is very close to the station. We hope you will come and check it out. Um, for us, this is what we've got today. If you have any questions, feedback, uh, show ideas, or anything of that nature, if you just want to say hello, you can reach us at questions at sakeonair.com or so on all social media, all the most of the regular ones at, at sakeonair. And you can find us on YouTube and SoundCloud and all that good stuff. So hopefully we will see you in another couple of weeks. Thank you both gentlemen and thank you, Justin. Yeah. Cheers to you guys. Cheers. Final Cheers. Kanpai. Kanpai. <laughs>